Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Paul Krugman. Paul joins us today to discuss the great inflation surge of 2021 and its implications for policy. Paul, welcome back to the show. Hi there. Good to be on. Yeah, it's great to have you on. In preparing for today's show, I went back and looked at our previous conversation, which was in 2017. And looking back now, much simpler times, we were worried about liquidity traps, you know, the anemic recovery, safe asset shortage. We even talked about Isaac Asimov back then. So much simpler times. And you know, what was interesting back then, I I think one of the key pieces of our conversation was this question that was looming, was there sufficient or adequate aggregate demand back then? Was policy doing enough, fiscal and monetary, to speed up the recovery, to get us to full employment? And from that perspective, if we flip it to today, the question is the opposite. Is there too much aggregate demand? And I never thought we'd be in this place where we're having to answer and wrestle with this question. Yeah. And in a way, it's the political economy of this has been just wild, not at all what I would have feared, what I would have expected. Of course, that's my guess is that two or three years from now, we'll be having the same discussion we were having in 2017. That This is not a permanent state of affairs. But for now, at least, yeah, we are worrying about overheating, which is kind of a welcome change in some ways, although problematic in others. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with you. I think the same structural forces that were with us before the pandemic that led to low interest rates, low inflation, will be back on the other side. So I agree with you on that point there. The other thing that's really interesting about this day and age is just how quickly, you alluded to this in your article that we're going to base our conversation off today, but how quickly inflation has become such an important issue. I mean, as you mentioned in your piece in the New York Times, that inflation just a few months ago wasn't this poignant of an issue, but now it's front and central. It has arguably caused the big pal pivot. Any thoughts on how rapidly public opinion has changed on this? And moreover, it has political implications too, right? So any thoughts on that part of it? Well, I mean, part of it is some of this, maybe most of it is actually spontaneous you know, public opinion. Although we always want to bear in mind that public views on inflation, people don't know what the CPI is or what's happening to it. It's a few visible things and it's overwhelmingly is the price of gasoline. So gas prices went up a lot and people say, oh my God, gas prices are up. And we might be surprised. Wholesale gas prices are down about 40 cents from their peak now. And prices at the pump will presumably follow in a few weeks. And I wouldn't be surprised if inflation suddenly becomes a whole lot less salient. But there was also, it was clearly, if, as you remember very well, back in you know, 10 years ago, there was enormous furor over inflation when there was really nothing which to base it, except again, that blip in gasoline prices. There's a segment of journalism, some of it's political, some of it is generational, that's always prime. There's a part of elite opinion for whom it is always 1979. And they had their moment. 2021 was their chance finally to relive the glory days of their youth. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So maybe you know, a few decades from now, if we have something like this again, and that generational element's not there, it will be interesting to see what the policy response is. Plus, we've been through this, and if we get to the other side successfully, maybe there'll be more humility in interpreting the implications for the broader economy. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm spending a lot of time, a little bit in the longer piece that I wrote, and some more coming shortly after we're having this conversation on the 40s, the post-war inflation, which was actually two years of quite high inflation, but then ended and went down the memory hole. Nobody talks about the inflation rate in 1947. And it's possible that a few years from now, the inflation of 2021 will also have kind of been regarded ex post as a flash in the pan, although I guess we're forbidden to use the word, but as having been transitory. (laughs) That's a good point. I've been looking for synonyms, and there are some words I didn't know, but fugacious turns out to be a synonym. Maybe in the end, we'll regard this as a fugacious inflation. Now, that's an interesting point, because if we look back to 2008, which you do in your article, and we'll come to your article in just a minute, but in 2008, many at the FOMC were also screaming high inflation because of commodity prices, right? And that ended pretty quickly. And we seem to have forgotten that as well. We don't see many people looking to that as a baseline or a reference point in this conversation. 
Partly, of course, there's, I think there's a fallacy of misplaced concreteness. And this one is not all about commodity prices, although about things that in a lot of ways are behaving like commodity prices. So, Right. And going back to your point about you know, this inflation experience going down the memory hole, a part of me has always wondered if we're just hardwired to think in terms of growth rates versus levels. And let me give you an illustration of this. So and you know this period real well because your work has been done on it, but the Great Depression Coming out of the Great Depression, the, the sharpest part, you know, 1929, 1933. And then right after that, I believe 1936, the Fed began to worry about inflation, even though there was still, in terms of levels, a big gap between where the price level had been and where it was. There'd been some inflation. And, and I just wonder, do we have a hard time processing levels versus growth rates on this issue? Probably. You know, I remember when gas was, I actually should know this tells you that I don't drive all that much, but people remember gas prices the summer before last when they were really depressed because of the pandemic. You know, and where we are right now is, well, gas prices are up. Actually, oil prices and wholesale gas prices, not yet retail, are at their levels of 2018. If the price of the pump ends up being the same as it was in 2018, will people still be saying, oh, look, at gas is so expensive because it's up over the past year, or will they say, well, it's kind of like, like normal? I don't really know the answer to that, but I do wonder. Yeah, very fascinating. Let's go to your article. It's titled The Year of Inflation Infamy, and I like that. It's very serious. <laughs> I'm calling this the Great Inflation Surge of 2021, since economists like to put great before things, but great title. I stole it. It's an old article by Bill Nordhaus about the 1952 oh. inflation. So, ah, okay, okay. All the title pretty much from him. Okay, that makes sense. Well, you begin your article by talking about the history, and you already alluded to one experience in 1948, but walk us through some of the past experiences as a way to maybe help us better understand what we're going through now. There have been, roughly speaking, three eras of inflation shock since World War II. There's the immediate post-war ones, both 46, 48, and then the Korean War, which were just simple too much money chasing too few goods, a surge in demand, coupled in, in the 40s one with an economy that was still adjusting to the dislocations of the war. So some obvious parallels with now. Those came on fast. They were remarkably high. I mean, 20% inflation at its peak in that 40s inflation, but they went away quickly and left very little scar. Then there was the 70s. It starts in the 60s, but we mostly identify with the 70s. And that was the one that got seared into our collective and selective memory as, of inflation that just wouldn't go away and stayed high even when unemployment was high and all of that, which is the model that a lot of people are still working with. And then we had a, you know, spikes in inflation that were mostly commodity prices within, you know, associated with the Kuwait war, associated with that 2008 shock. And a slightly smaller one as the economy was coming out of the Great Recession, which all were all transitory by any standard. As I say in the article, there are three different kinds of inflation. It's not just too much money chasing too few goods. That was the story in 1947. But the inflation of the 70s, although it may have started that way, was all about leapfrogging wage and price setting. It was all about embedded expectations of inflation that kept it going. And then there are these commodity price shocks that produce you know, spikes in inflation, but are the kind of thing you want to just ride through. Yeah. And in your article, you mentioned we can learn a little bit from each of these different experiences, because what we're going through now is, is really unique. It's a combination of many of the things we saw then. So why don't you lead us off by talking about what is unique about this period and what's not unique about it? We certainly have had a period of pretty strong demand. The political miracle of 2020, 2021 was that we actually did provide a lot of fiscal support to the economy and a lot of monetary support also. We had a pretty close to a financial meltdown in March 2020, but the Fed just you know, threw trillions of dollars at it and it went away fast. But we also had an astonishingly generous relief package in 2020 and then another one in early 2021. All of which has led to real you know, personal incomes have stayed high despite the shutdown of a lot of the economy and a lot of demand sustained by that. So we have had probably some demand, you know, just plain excess spending inflation. And that's where important issues come up and how big a factor is all of that. Then we've also had the sort of idiosyncratic shocks, except this time it is oil, among other things, and it is food, among other things. But then there's the weird stuff. There's the used car shortage. There's the hotel rooms. 
and rental cars. And conceptually, those are similar to those blips that we had in the long period when inflation was actually pretty stable. And then there's, you know, the last bit, the self-sustaining inflation-driven inflation. So far, I don't actually see any of that. We don't have very good ways of measuring it, but for what it's worth, you just cannot see any hint in any of the data and even in the anecdotes that anybody is saying, well, I'm going to offer my workers a 10% wage because I figure all my competitors are going to be raising their wages by 10% over the course of the next year. There's no sign that that kind of 70s type inflation is happening, at least so far. Yeah, it, it's striking to look at the bond market, for example. They would quickly incorporate any concerns about inflation being unanchored. And right before we recorded this, I checked the 10-year treasury yield is a 1.39%. Yeah, it's shocking. I have to say that I I am wary about the bond market because the bond market doesn't set wages and prices. And in a way, we have this concept called the expected rate of inflation, which is really doesn't exist. There are what bond traders think inflation is going to be. There is what consumers. I'm not even sure that consumers really even have such a thing. But you know, there's a de facto kind of notion of what inflation might be that's built into the behavior. And there's people setting wages and prices. There's no arbitrage mechanism that forces all of these views to be the same. But still, the bond market is people putting their money on the line. And, and the bond market doesn't think that the 70s are coming back. Maybe it's a generational thing, right? I mean, if you ask us, good point. who are bond traders, they're all about 29 years old. So maybe they, <laughs> that's very different. They're wildly optimistic. Okay, that could be one hot take. On the wage price spiral prospects, a couple observations. One, and I got this from Mark Zandi, he notes that the Atlanta wage growth tracker, which is a pretty neat tool that you know accounts for changes in composition, who has the jobs. But if you look at it by like income levels, and I believe they list it by quintiles, almost all of the rapid wage growth we've seen is at the lowest levels. It's hard for me to see that being sustained. I mean, once this financial cushion from the federal government runs out, once we're on the other side of the pandemic, they might have a permanent you know, level increase in their wage, but it's hard to see sustained wage growth at that level. Is that a reasonable assumption? I think that's right. I mean, the wage growth, I mean, the thing that gives me a bit of pause, I'm not worried at all about used car prices. I think that's clearly something that's going to last. Wages is something that is you know, traditionally kind of sticky and inertial. But what we're seeing doesn't look like that kind of wage growth. It looks like there is a shortage of workers, especially low paid workers, especially workers in unpleasant jobs who, for the time being, have the luxury of saying no, partly because of the financial cushion and maybe because they had a bit of you know, a moment of revelation saying, boy, I really hate my job. But it's not, it doesn't look sustainable. And it's also worth pointing out, by the way, that the bottom, I think it's quartile, whatever, the bottom quartile of workers is a lot of workers, but not a lot of labor costs because they're so poorly paid. So the actual cost push effect of rapid wage gains down at that end of the scale is not that large. Yeah. The other observation about a wage price spiral is, and, and I may be wrong here, but it's hard for me to envision it just spontaneously occurring on its own. It's usually like endogenous. You think of like a, a really you know extreme case where you have hyperinflation. There's a reason why the wage price spiral occurs, right? The government is running fiscal policy really, really strong. Is it possible for a wage price spiral to emerge in the absence of really, really big fiscal packages? Well, we don't have a lot of experience. And actually, there's even some, depending on how seriously you take some of the academic research, there's the Nakamura Steinson stuff on the reverse, the wage price downward spiral of the 1980s, in which they argued that it had less to do with high unemployment and more to do with just people perceiving a regime change, which I find fascinating, but don't quite believe, but still could be true. It's certainly careful research. So it's possible. But the wage price spiral that we had in the 70s that took a long time. It took years and years of irresponsible policy to get to that point. And even if you think that we overdid fiscal stimulus this year, and even if you think that the economy is running too hot right now, the idea that really maybe six months of alarmingly high inflation prints is going to feed a decades-long wage price spiral, I mean, it's not we understand everything perfectly, but it's not what I would have right. expected given history. Yeah, I definitely need some perspective. I mean, the great inflation was from 1965 to the early 80s, almost 15, 16 years. So you're at a six-month period compared to that long run. 
puts things in perspective. The other thing I want to mention on this wage price spiral is, again, you know, what do we have to help generate this, what we see currently? And that is these big packages last few years, right? We had the stimulus checks. We got the unemployment insurance that may have contributed to this. And moving forward, even with President Biden's you know, infrastructure bill, and if Build Back Better does become you know law at some point, many people look at that and say that's going to create inflation. But from where I stand, that's really a small, small percent of GDP moving forward. So it should be inconsequential one way or the other. Is that right? That's right. People who should know better simply don't have a sense of the scale of the U.S. economy. We're a, what is it, something like a $23 trillion dollar economy. You have Build Back Better, if it happens, is going to spend something like $160 billion in the first year, partially paid for with higher taxes, which will depress demand. So the net stimulus is a fraction of a percent of GDP. I mean, I, I think the habit of quoting many budget measures as 10-year totals is really doing a lot of damage here because you say, oh, well, American Rescue Plan was $1.9 trillion and Build Back Better is $1.75 trillion, and but yeah, but one was immediate outlays and the other over a decade. And again, this is a CBO estimate of cumulative GDP over the next decade is $288 trillion. So that gives you some perspective there. I want to go back to this point about demand or aggregate demand and, and the level of it. And, you know, many people like your friend Larry Summers was arguing in early 2021, we're just putting too much aggregate demand out there. And my reply would be to that point is that if you look at the level of aggregate demand, and you, and you mentioned this in your article as well, it's really where it would have been had there been no pandemic. So we're really right on trend. So you can imagine a world where there was no pandemic. We continue to grow along like we did prior to the pandemic, and inflation probably would still be low at the same size of the economy, same level of aggregate demand. Is it really the level of aggregate demand, or is it the composition of the demand that's driving this inflation? Let's just say, I think it's mostly composition, but it is worth saying that it looks as if aggregate supply, even leaving aside the sort of bottleneck issues, is somewhat lower than we thought it was going to be because of the great resignation because the uh, number of people in the labor force is, you know, is below where we thought it was going to be. A fair number of people retired, having lost their job, they figured no point in going back to work because I'm already not that far from retirement. And some people still staying out because they figure they can for the time being. So aggregate supply to potential GDP is probably a percentage point. We can play with those numbers, but a potential GDP is probably a bit lower than we thought it was going to be. But mostly, yeah, mostly this inflation is overwhelmingly concentrated in durable goods, aside from the commodities. And that's not because overall consumer spending is extremely high. It's because I keep on trying to find out a less elitist, clear metaphor. But anyway, it's, you know, people couldn't go to the gym, so they bought Pelotons. That compositional effect is dominating. I mean, at the peak, durable goods consumption was 34% above pre-pandemic levels. Staggering. That's not the stimulus package doing it. That's people buying stuff because they couldn't do anything else. Right. So you could imagine a world where we have the pandemic and we didn't get the generous federal support. People still would have you know, pulled back from services just because of fears of the COVID virus and bought these physical goods because that's just the way it had to be. Yeah. I mean, if durable goods consumption had been up by 29% instead of 34%, we would still have a whole lot of supply chain problems. Right, right, right. So this, I think, should make us optimistic about this next year and, and the possibility of getting past it. Because I know you've seen this data too, but if you look at the PCE measure of durable goods, they've been on a 25-year deflationary run. I mean, they literally prices have been getting cheaper year after year after year. Maybe we can thank global capitalism for that. It seems to me that the sudden spike we've seen in the price, it's not sustainable given all those global pressures that first created the deflation. A lot of durable goods, I mean, part of it is just IT, but just in general, yeah, goods have tended to get not just relatively, but absolutely cheaper over time. And now we have this sudden shortage of basically difficulties in delivering stuff. But among other things, that's the kind of thing that we expect markets to fix, right? There are really strong incentives and it's happened. It takes time. And most of the big retailers say that they have adequate inventory for the holiday season. The shipping rates have peaked, seem to be coming down. A lot of straws in the wind suggesting that a year from now, it will not look at all the way it does right now. 
Yeah, yeah. It's interesting is that, you know, many of the people who are, you know, big supporters of markets, myself included, but many of my market loving friends are losing their religion on this point, I think. They're losing their faith that the markets can solve this issue. At least they've lost sight of that one dimension which has been interesting to observe. The other thing about durable goods, I guess I would make before we move on, is there's only so many durable goods we can buy, right? I mean, I can only put so many TVs, exercise equipment, couches in my house. At some point, I am physically constrained. Well, I'm always suspicious of arguments like that. I mean, it's true. And there's some hints of that out there. But you always want to bear in mind that there are particularly lower income people may not have bought all the stuff that they might have wanted to. And we are seeing much bigger wage gains at the bottom. So maybe, you know, you may have as big a TV as you could possibly want, but maybe somebody at the 25th percentile of the wage distribution doesn't. So I'm not sure about that one. It's possible. What I think may be happening is that people who were compensating for pandemic restrictions by buying stuff are now getting sick of the stuff they bought. (laughs) Apparently, if you want to buy a a used Peloton on Craigslist, it's getting quite cheap. Very fascinating. I want to provide one uh, decomposition of the CPI number because it came in really hot, as you know, and you mentioned in your article, 6.8% in November PPI came in almost double digit, but let's look at the CPI. And there's an analyst from Moody's named Ryan Sweet, and he did a decomposition of that number. And it's, I think it's, it's very instructive to take a look at it. He shows 2.5 percentage points of that 6.8 was energy related. And we know that's coming down. He also calculated 1.8% in supply chain constrained industries and you know everything we've, we've talked about here. But if you go 6.8 minus 2.5 minus 1.8, the CPI would be at 2.5%, which is about where you would want the CPI you know, relative to the PC. It's always a little bit above the PC target. So it just seems very obvious to me, and again, maybe I'm being too widely optimistic here, but that we are headed in the right direction. All the forces are there. Well, yeah. I mean, I've been looking at people who've been using a consistent set of categories to try and get through this. We, you know, core inflation was supposed to do that, but it's not because of the peculiar components. But the CEA is doing a consistent measure that tries to exclude pandemic-related stuff. Matt Klein has a substack, and he's been doing that. And they're all kind of suggesting that there's a lot less happening to underlying inflation and the headline numbers. Now, there are some other stuff in there. And actually, I hate the fact that I'm being forced to pay attention to all this high frequency, informal data, you know, not really my specialty, but the rents, Zillow and places like that are showing much bigger rent increases than the CPI is, but that's because the CPI is the rents that people are actually paying, whereas these rental companies are the rents on newly rented apartments. And so there's probably a fair bit of rent, which is a big component of price measures. There's probably a fair bit of rent inflation still in the pipeline. You don't want to assume that we're going to see instant gratification. I don't think we're seeing. On the other hand, look underneath the hood, and we don't really have a 7% inflation economy out there. Yeah, most of the projections I've seen by you know different firms that, that look closely at this, including Moody's, is it's going to come down gradually. It's not going to be you know suddenly we're at two percent. And Mark Zandi actually spoke to this point about housing. Housing is the big thing that's still going to linger with us, as you mentioned. But he says, look, what that's going to do is it's going to maybe take the PCE from 1.6, 1.7 closer to two. So we'll be closer to target. That's his sense of its its importance. Is it won't push us way above two, but get us closer to two given the other disinflationary forces we might see. I wouldn't be shocked if we have a PCE that's still above three by the end of next year. But how bad is that, especially if there's pretty good indications that it it is on its way down? And of course, that 2% target itself is a pretty weird animal. Once you start to look into the history of it, it's pretty strange. So of course, we could be wrong. But at the moment, it just does look like 1979. Yeah. Well, that's a nice segue into the next part of this conversation. And that relates to your article, like, you know, how hard should the Fed move? How much should it squeeze? And I want to see what is your take of why the three rate hikes this last meeting, December FOMC, why the talk, you know, of tapering faster? They even mentioned shrinking the balance sheet. That's being discussed now at the FOMC. What does that accomplish in your mind, given everything we just talked about, that a lot of this inflation will work itself out? Is this all about preventing that inflationary expectations from taking off? You think that's where it is? 
There is a really good question. Why is the Fed still buying long-term assets? Actually, there's a question about why do they ever do it? I've never been persuaded that QE actually does anything except signaling. But in any case, I think it makes perfect sense to bring that to an end quickly. The rest, I think these are small numbers. If it's three normal rate hikes, 75 basis points is not like, you know, I remember uh, Paul Volcker. Uh, this is not the Fed hitting the economy over the head with a sledgehammer. I'm mixing metaphors here, but this is a very gentle tap on the brakes whose purpose is arguably mainly psychological. It's a way of saying, again, I'm showing my age, but the elder Bush used to read his stage directions, you know, message, I care, message, we care, (laughs) we're aware, we know that inflation is worrying people. So we're doing this to signal that, yeah, we're aware, we haven't committed ourselves, actually, and quite possible that it won't happen. But it's a reasonable thing to do to say, look, if anybody is thinking that this is going to be the Arthur Burns Fed, and we're just going to juice up the economy regardless, and, and let inflation run wild. No, we are not those guys. Not a bad strategy, especially since the concrete impact of the rate hikes that are so far on the table is really just not going to be very big. Yeah, that seems to be the correct take in my view as well. The Fed wants to guarantee that it doesn't add any fuel to the fire. It's going to keep you know, long-run expectations anchored, and they are. I mean, long-run inflation expectations, at least forecasters and markets tell us that. I know households have seen a little bit of an increase, but I think that's the key. Is It's not so much that they're responding to the actual inflation we're seeing, but it's more about preventing future unhinging and anchoring of inflation. Yeah, it's really notable also, if we look at the latest set of forecasts, that they do not expect to be causing a recession, that unemployment will continue to fall. So their view is very much that we are tapping on the brakes, but not really in a way that's going to bring this recovery to an end. Yeah, they have unemployment falling to 3.5% next year, which is pretty remarkable, along with 2.6% PCE inflation. So if that's the world we end up in next year, then hats off to the Federal Reserve for navigating in this storm with amazing deafness. Let's talk about that. So, you know, one of the things, again, is that inflation, what motivated your article, this conversation, is inflation has become kind of like, you know, enemy number one, like Jay Powell had alluded to in his press conference. And it's affecting, you know, President Biden's poll numbers. It's affecting a lot of conversations. But I think it's useful to do the counterfactual and say, okay, what if we hadn't had the support that we had? You know, what if we had acted on these inflationary concerns very, very aggressively? Where would we be? And we didn't do that. And as a result, again, we're back to the dollar size of the economy. We've had a rapid recovery in the labor markets. There's still room to go. But maybe walk us through what you think, you know, the proper counterfactual is here. Okay. I think you want to make a difference between what we did last year and what we did this year. Last year, if we hadn't done what we did, we hadn't had the really big combination of unemployment benefits, business lending, checks, although I I actually think that the checks were in some ways the least important part. But if we hadn't provided all that economic support, we could have had utter catastrophe. You were taking 20 million jobs lost, business grinding to a halt. If we hadn't largely held people financially harmless, we really could have had an economic implosion on top of everything else. So that was absolutely critical and hard to see anything negative from it. Now, we did have a big package early this year. And it's funny, I wouldn't make the case that that package was enormously important in our current economic recovery, for the same reason I don't think it was very inflationary. Because I think that was actually a pretty low multiplier fiscal package. There was a lot of aid to state and local governments, which has mostly not been spent. There were the $1,400 checks, which to an important extent were not spent, at least not right away. You know, state and local stuff will be spent over time, but that's good. It'll be investment in the end. And there were unemployment benefits, which helped a lot. But the main thing that the package did was it actually you know, drastically reduced child poverty, which is a, not just a really good thing in itself, you know, humanitarian, but also as an investment in the future. But I don't think that the macro side of the ARP was all that large. If you look at the debate that Summers and I were having early on, he was saying this is going to be a huge multiplier. It's going to cause enormous expansion and demand, and that's going to cause inflation. I said, no, I don't think it'll have much of a multiplier. And the funny thing was it didn't have much of a multiplier, but we got the inflation anyway because of these other factors. I would not give the ARP most of the credit for the really good job numbers, although I think in general, lots of fiscal support was critical in getting us through all of this. But yeah, I think that the counterfactual, if we hadn't had that package, is that we would have a little bit less job creation, which would be a bad thing. 
and we'd have a lot more individual financial misery, which would be a really bad thing. Okay. Going back to Larry Summers, so you guys had extensive conversations. I remember watching one that Marcus Brunermeyer hosted. We got the inflation he said we're going to get. We got it for different reasons than he said we would get it. That's right? Yeah. I have to say, look, in the distant past, I've been on the receiving end of the same thing. I mean, lots of people thought I predicted the Asian financial crisis, when in fact, I predicted problems for Asia that were quite different from the ones that actually happened. That stopped me from getting a lot of undeserved credit. So, all right, it happens. Yeah, that's been my sense, too, is that not so much him, but some others out there who've been very vocal about this are saying, see, I told you so. And it's not clear to me that they told us so in this particular context. Yeah. And, you know, if we're going to be serious about doing economics, we do point predictions, but lots of stuff can happen. And we want to ask about, well, yeah, but the mechanism, did things actually happen the way you said they would? And even if the headline number looks like what you were talking about, if it didn't happen for the reason you said it was, then, you know, that needs to be admitted. Right. We all make conditional forecasts and we need to admit as much when things change. All right. So taking this counterfactual conversation to the next step, again, going back to 2020, not just 2021, but the world could have been a much worse place. Like you said, widespread bankruptcy, the mother of all financial crisis. Keeping nominal income stable, I think, was very important to accomplishing that outcome. But what's striking about it, and you mentioned this at the beginning of the show, is that it was even possible that there was a political support for it. And I want to just kind of go back and look at this from the context of the work that you did in 1998, your paper calling, I think, for something similar in spiritual what we saw. So maybe you remind us of your 1998 paper, and does it fit what we saw in 2020? Okay, there are different pieces. And in, in a way, you know, my 1998 paper really didn't talk much about fiscal policy, which I now have changed my views on that a little bit, mostly out of political economy reasons. I was all for very aggressive monetary policy and raising inflation targets. And I still think that the logic of that was right, but the politics of it turned out to be much harder than I realized. And fiscal policy turns out to be much more doable than I realized, although still problematic. But there were a couple of big messages from the 98 paper, which was, and I do think the best thing I ever wrote. One of them was that when interest rates are very low, do not worry about the money supply. Do not worry about inflationary impacts from monetary expansion. Also, really do not worry about the central bank's balance sheet because the money multiplier is a really useless concept once you're in a situation like that, where banks will mostly just add monetary base to their reserves. And the kind of implied point was in a very low interest rate world, also don't worry much about public debt. And that's something, of course, that I got into a lot more after the 2008 crisis. And we somehow ended up taking on those lessons. The Fed was uninhibited about going ahead and vastly expanding its balance sheet to save the financial markets. The federal government was remarkably willing to spend a lot of money on helping people in a time of need without worrying about what the debt number looked like. So we got this hugely aggressive and relative, considering the scale of the calamity, it's hugely successful policy response. Yeah. Now, I know some will push back against this interpretation. They'll say, well, but David, this was a supply shock recession. But one takeaway, one lesson I've learned from this past two years is that it's really hard to disentangle a pure supply shock from the other side of the economy. And there were a number of papers that were done. I remember Ivan Werning and even Michael Woodford had a paper out on how when you have something big like this, it has these ripple effects that ultimately generate distinct and separate aggregate demand shortfalls as well. So it is important for the government to provide some support. Oh, if the government hadn't been in there providing support, first of all, if the Fed hadn't been in there, we were really on the edge of a sort of souped up version of what happened after we even fell. With COVID, suddenly nobody knew which businesses were solvent and financial markets froze up. We could have easily had a financial multiplier effect in which a supply shock turned into a catastrophic demand shock. And then a lot of people suddenly lost all of their normal income, their market income. And if they had been forced to slash their consumption, we would have had a conventional demand shock on top of that. So no, this could easily have propagated into something much worse. So yeah, we did the right thing. And on the whole, when all is said and done, we did not have the people selling apples on street corners, despite this massive dislocation. And that was good policy. Yeah. And again, that's the kind of the counterfactual I, I want more people to think about is where we could have been compared to where we are. 
and the trade-offs involved in that. It is remarkable to me, though, that this willingness to do what was done. And again, going forward, you know, we don't expect it to be repeated like every year, but just during this crisis, it was done. And in a way that's long run sustainable. You know, stepping back, you have your work, you have your colleagues at Princeton. My colleague now, Scott Sumner, wrote a paper titled The Princeton School of Macroeconomics, which was you, Ben Bernanke, Michael Woodford, Lars Svensson, I guess Scotty Ergenson would be thrown in there as well. And he makes the point that everything you guys wrote about finally came to fruition 20 years later when the Fed adopted this new framework as well as the response we saw from the federal government. Is that, you think, a reasonable interpretation of history? In slightly different mechanisms. I mean, the Fed actually is serious. They read stuff and they talk to academic economists and they do a lot of research on their own. So the Fed, they learned a lot from all of this stuff. Government response was a little bit funnier because there is part of the political system does listen. If you actually ask about some members of Congress and the Senate really are in touch with and are communicating with and have paid attention to this, but it's only half the political spectrum. And if we ask the question, how was it that with a Republican president, we managed to get this massive fiscal response. And I think the answer is that actually half the political spectrum was simply clueless. They had absolutely no idea how to deal with this. This was not part of their mental universe. The idea crises that just came nowhere were not something they were sort of like, now what? And on the other side, you did have people. And we asked, how do we get those generous unemployment benefits? It's largely Senator Ron Wyden, who definitely is in touch with this stuff. And it was basically that one side had reasonably clear ideas that were directly or indirectly influenced by academic research. And the other side was just sort of help somebody give us some, the old British show, Yes, Minister, has the, we must do something, this is something, therefore we must do it. And that's kind of what happened in 2000. And it worked out fine, but I don't expect it. That's not a mechanism you want to count on in the future. Yeah, so that's one of the things I wonder about is moving forward, will we be able to replicate what we did in 2020? And when I say replicate what we did, I, I want to think this more generally, I would call this policy mix a form of level targeting. So fiscal and monetary work together, keep the level of the economy on its trajectory. Do you think going forward, this is something we will continue to do? Will we learn from this lesson? Will it be internalized? Will it be able to be replicated, I guess, in future crisis? Well, it's going to depend a lot on who's in charge, obviously. And that's not just the United States. I actually think that Europe has moved substantially in this direction. The European Central Bank now talks like the Fed, very different from the way it used to be. The Bank of England, despite they just had hike rates, but they are also in the same universe. Some overseas governments depends a lot, but even the Germans are sounding almost reasonable these days. Here, you tell me, you know, who is going to be running things in the United States in 2025? I mean, as it turned out, Steve Mnuchin was a pretty reasonable guy on macro policy, which I don't think was would have been anybody's forecast, but it's also unlikely if it's a Republican administration that, that we'll get anybody that reasonable at Treasury. So we don't really want to talk about politics here, but it depends a lot. Look, if we're going to have a Powell Brainerd Fed a few years from now, will people like that? And if we're going to have people like Janet Yellen running Treasury and making policy, then yeah, we will get this. I mean, we have at this point a cadre of economic policymakers who have moved a long way from the kind of hard line, get price stability and everything else will fall in place view of the world. I'm hopeful, too, that instead we'll have, you know where I'm going to go with this. We have a world full of young and upcoming policymakers who want to see nominal GDP stability going forward, but some policy mix that will lead to that outcome. Let me go back to an observation you raised at the beginning of the show as we near the end of the program, and that is you mentioned you thought we might be back or will be back in kind of a secular stagnation world once we get to the other side of the pandemic. Did I hear that correctly? Why do you say that? What gives you reason to believe that will be the case? Okay, there's some conflicting, as always, there's academic research that can disagree, but I think secular stagnation is mainly a demographic story, that when all is said and done, low fertility rates in the advanced world, and actually now in China as well, which mean stagnant or falling working age population, just create a world of weak investment demand. There's a reason that Japan in the 90s was a dress rehearsal for all the rest of us, because they entered this world of demographic slowdown before the rest of us. And then there's an uncertainty factor, which is technology. You can hope that we will have faster technological progress than we've had in recent years and 
that it will be the kind of technological progress that drives investment demand. But I would say that that's possible and certainly not something to count on. So mostly it's demography. And if anything, the demographic thing has gotten, I'd not say worse, but there's nothing necessarily wrong with having you know, zero population growth, provided that you have policies that let you maintain full employment despite it. But we are looking at fertility is still going down. Immigration is down. So all of the things that boosted us out of the possibility of secular stagnation in the past you know, all have gone away. All of the things that made Alvin Hansen wrong in 1938, he was basically talking demography. And he was wrong largely because of the baby boom. Now we're in the world that Alvin Hansen envisions 85 years ago. So, Paul, you're expecting a world where we return to low rates, which I think also means continued demand for safe assets like U.S. government debt. And again, looking into Japan, Japan has a really large amount of debt to GDP, yet they still have low inflation. They have demographics. The one you know pushback that I get, I, I share this view too about demographics. It comes from the kind of the Charles Goodhart view that demographics actually are going to push inflation in the other direction. But to me, the best evidence against that is Japan. It would have happened in Japan already, right, if that were the case. Yeah, I mean, Japan is already at age dependency ratios that we won't be at for decades, we don't think. And if there was going to be an inflationary surge as retirees start spending down their children's inheritance, it hasn't happened there yet. And the thing is, I think that part of the problem here, I think people think too much in terms of consumer spending and saving, which is not irrelevant, but the really big mover here is investment. And if your working age population is shrinking, then you don't need to build a lot of houses. You don't need to build a lot of office buildings. So that's where the main action is. And I, I think the demography is still the huge driver here. Yeah, it seems like it is. I mean, if China is having the same challenge that we've had, and we're having the same challenge that Japan has had, this will be with us for some time. Well, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Paul Krugman. Paul, thank you for coming back on the show. Thank you. Take care. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.